It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and we're starting a brand new month off, November 1st, 1991. we got five movies to look at today, so let's go ahead and jump on that into it. So let's start off with the first movie that we have here, and that is Wes Craven's The People Under the Stairs. In every neighborhood, there is one house that adults whisper about, and children cross the street to avoid. Now, Wes Craven creator of A Nightmare on Elm Street, takes you inside. Something's in here. We gotta get out of here, Leroy. All sorts of rumors about what goes on in that house. The police never took it serious. She's been feeding that thing between the walls again. Very, very tense about this. What goes on in this house is a sin. But what goes on under the stairs is a nightmare. <laughs> Wes Craven's The People Under the Stairs. Yeah, you know, it's hard to believe this actually was Wes Craven's first major success after A Nightmare on Elm Street. He had made some movies like Deadly Friend, uh, Serpent in the Rainbow, Shocker. These movies that were not the biggest hits and didn't have that longevity like A Nightmare on Elm Street had. But this was actually the first major hit for Wes Craven in a long time. And the movie really is something special, something very good. It's a very good film from Craven. It's very, it's very scary at times. It can be very funny at times. It's kind of a horror comedy in a way. Uh, some of the ideas are very interesting. There is, a, there's a lot of satirical comedy, go, satirical elements going on here too, because not only do you have stuff like uh, gentrification, class warfare, capitalism, uh, just the, there's also this element of rich people getting the benefit over the poor people, that that type of stuff. It's all over this movie, and it doesn't feel forced. It doesn't feel like it's trying to stick get a message to you in your face it knows that it has to be an entertaining movie to get keep your investment in there and it can also throw in those elements there the satirical elements to make it stand down on its own and it does just that it does a very good job with that and um it's a pretty good movie overall it's a very fun movie very scary at times can also be very funny and uh there are some thematic elements here that i thought that was that really did impress me about this particular film um so yeah, if you're looking for some of Wes Craven's more underrated works, definitely check out The People Under the Stairs. It's one of his more underrated films. Uh, so with that said, let's go ahead and move on to the next movie, and that is the sequel to the 1986 film Highlander 2, The Quickening. What a title. <laughs> centuries on Earth. Nothing could have prepared them for the quickening. Christopher Lambert, Sean Connery, Highlander 2, The Quickening. So not only is the title really bad, but this movie in general is... Yeah, it's pretty bad. I mean, it's a movie that's not only a major step down compared to the first movie, which has its fun elements to it, but it's largely mostly remembered because of the soundtrack by Queen, but at least it makes more sense than anything in this particular film because, oh boy, this is like a complete disaster on so many levels. I mean, just the way that this movie completely retcons everything from the first movie, creates a whole changes so much there, has characters that are not developed well whatsoever, the editing is terrible, too many things are going on, the plot holes in here, just the way that p things are used in here for no particular reason whatsoever, like, um, there's a scene where they use ama the Scottish the Scottish bagpipe version of Amazing Grace, which is most notable in something like Star Trek II, the Wrath of Khan, Star Trek II, the Wrath of Khan, but here, it makes no sense whatsoever, and it's just like, 
you really can't understand what the heck they were thinking with this. And this movie would cost a lot of money for 1991 standards. $34 million for this particular movie. And they shot this in Argentina. And you have to ask yourself, where did all that money go? I mean, $34 million doesn't go away just like that. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a mess on so many levels. Like, Sean Connery has made some really bad movies, especially later on in his career. This is probably one of one of his worst ones. This is right up there with the Avengers, the 98 one, and then the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. And, um, it's a mess. It's a mess on so many levels. And even with the alternate version that they did a couple of years later, it doesn't really do that much anything, anything better than the, what this movie did. I mean, it's a mess on so many levels. It's a movie that just... It's one of the worst movies of the year, easily. Maybe the worst movie of the entire year. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's absolutely horrible. It is absolutely horrible, so... Uh, with that said, let's go ahead and get on to another movie, which I don't know off the top of my head right now, and now I do. Uh, Dustin Hoffman, Nicole Kidman, and Bruce Willis in Billy Bathgate. You don't understand about a guy like this. He was a nobody, just like me. But he had brains, and he had guns. I'm lying, and look at him now. Whatever happens to me in my life, it's going to have something to do. Mr. Schultz. Mr. Schultz, how's it feel to be public enemy number one? So I'm no public enemy. So what are you? Public benefactor. To a kid from the streets. Hey, Billy! Dutch Schultz was everything he could ever dream of being. Who are you? Billy, that game? You in a gang? No, sir. I didn't expect to learn anything. I think for the real training, you gotta go right to the top. So he watched. He killed that man. Forget it. He listened. Why are you always listening to what you shouldn't be listening to? And he learned. Did you ever fire a gun? No, sir. Then you should learn. You were as good at you, kid. You're my prodigy. You're Mr. Schultz's girl. No, I'm not his girl. He's my gangster. Now he's waiting for the moment. It will all be his. I'm so nice about you. I can't see straight. You're so nice to know. So let me see if I get this straight. You have Dustin Hoffman, Bruce Willis, a Nicole Kidman that was rising in her career at the time, uh, Robert Benton, the director of Kramer vs. Kramer, and Tom Stoppard, the writer of such films as Brazil, Empire of the Sun, The Russia House, uh, a $45 million budget, and this turns out to be one of the biggest misfires of the entire year. I mean, I mean, where did they go wrong? That trailer pretty much tells you everything you need to know about why this movie does not work at all because it's pretty much every single gangster film cliche rolled into one. And mo like we had Mobsters earlier in the year, which was pretty much the same thing. The typical gangster film cliches all over. Nothing really exciting, nothing really interesting about any of the people involved in this. Same thing here. It's just like you have all these great actors in here and you don't give them anything really good to do to work with. That so much so that even the writer of the book that this is based off of distances, distances himself on the film because they took so much out of that book instead of actually putting it into the film. It's just, it just makes no sense whatsoever. And they're just, this is clearly something that they were trying to just go for and just make because they got Dustin Hoffman, they got Bruce Willis, everything's going to work out fine for them because they're such big stars. And it's just like, you can't really do that. You got to have more than that. Like, there has to be more. So, there has to be something there to really stand out here besides just the people that you have working behind the scenes and on the camera. But, yeah, you can tell this movie didn't do so well. It really is a lackluster gangster movie. It doesn't, it doesn't work on any level. It has the same cliches we've seen done over and over again. It doesn't distance itself from anything else that we've seen before. Basically, we got this because Goodfellas was the big hit that it was the year before, and Disney... No, is seeing other other studios find success. They did this last year. They did this last year with um, 
Firebirds trying to capture Top Gun success, and now they did it with Billy Vatkin because Goodfellas was such a big success. But um, they had Martin Scorsese and this and a good script. This movie does not have none of that whatsoever. Despite the good actors they have here, it's just a disappointment on so many levels. So, uh, yeah, Billy Bathgate was not a very good movie. So, um, moving on, let's go ahead and move on to the next movie, and that is. I'm just gonna keep doing that because I'm. I think I, I, I usually have a good idea what movies are coming out, but. As I'm talking, and I keep forgetting what the next movie is going to be, I have to go to that. So let's move on to that next movie, and that is Year of the Gun. David Rayborn came to Italy to write his first novel. How to be a young and impoverished American in love with Rome. But now, the characters are all too real. I'm going to change all the names. Nobody's going to be recognizable. And the events too close to the truth. I told you about Operation Morrow. Nobody. I made it up. It's Rupiak. He's dead. We're next. Of the gun rated R. Not one of John Frankenheimer's best movies. This was right at the point where his career was kind of taking a downturn spiral. Uh, he would come back briefly with something like Ronin, but other than that, though, his career was really taking a downward fall compared to what it was at the beginning. And there's potential here for something good, but the, pr the premise is just too complicated. So much it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The acting is not very good. The writing isn't very good. It's a movie that just really fails to get anything going, despite the people that they have involved here. You've got Andrew McCarthy, uh, Sharon Stone, uh, Valerie Galeno, who was just in Hot Shots, John Pankow's in this, and like I said, there's just nothing here to make this work. It's a, it's a dismal thriller. The tension really isn't all that th all there. The twists that, that are in here are not really all that surprising. And it just really doesn't make any sense how this guy really knew wh what was going on behind the scenes just from the way that he found out. It's just, it makes no sense whatsoever. It's a shame that, that it doesn't work because there is potential here. It just doesn't work script wise. It's a movie that quickly was forgotten and you can kind of see why. Year of the Gun, completely forgettable. So, with that said, let's go ahead and move on to the last movie that we have here and that is 29th Street. Frank Pesh Sr. worked hard for 35 years to build a good life. Did you make that? Yeah, I made it, right? And it cost me a dollar to make one dollar. Pop, you get better pizza in Korea. Who the hell made that, Michelin? Well, you put it in the trunk and use it as a spare. Yeah. To raise a loving family. Do you see my service revolver around? You know, so I gotta do everything around here. I gotta find your gun. Maybe I should ride in the car with you. To have his own lawn. Get out! The heat from his body is burning a hole in my lawn. His son never worked an honest day in his life maybe i could become an astronaut is it is there little people going around in your head and he couldn't even get drafted cover your left eye and read line seven on the chart tag of thorn is there something wrong with you boy i really don't think it's fair that we got to take a test that we didn't study for it's a damn urine examination boy what are you some kind of mama look you'll never get a city job excuse me i just need a rope I i'll hang myself but after today he may never have to work Again. I'm a finalist in the lottery. Right here, I'm a finalist in the lottery. I got a shot at $6.2 million. I got 8 million tickets sitting in a shoebox upstairs, and you bought one ticket. I'm lucky. God protects the dumb. Salud! This is my girlfriend, Sheila. She's been dying to meet you, Frank. Got the lottery ticket on you? Yeah, why? I might be interested in buying it. They'll cut your throat and go out for a calzone afterwards. Oh, we got problems. I never wanted a ticket! I was perfectly happy in my life without it! Danny Aiello. You didn't give him the ticket. Did you give him the ticket? Anthony LaPaglia. Do you feel lucky tonight? You have no idea. And the lucky, lucky winner is... 29th Street. Frankie! Frankie! Come on! Why? Wake up! Why? I really think I nailed it this time. Oh, I'll get that out of here. In a way, this kind of reminds me of a more serious version of that movie Lottery Ticket from about 10 years ago that had Ice Cube in it and Bow Wow, except that this is this is obviously done more seriously, and instead of guys like Ice Cube and Bow Wow, you have Danny Aiello and Anthony LaPaglia, and also Lainey Kazan is in here, and... Um, I gotta say, I was pleasantly surprised by this one. I didn't hear too much about this one. I hardly even knew it even existed. 
But as far as the movie itself goes, it is pretty good. Like it works because of the acting. It works because there is a good, in there is an interesting story here, and um, it's probably one of Danny Aiello's most underrated performances. I mean, this and uh, Once Around, two very good movies that came out in '91. And like I said, the premise here I think is very good. I th I like the idea that his fa that this guy's father uses his son's lottery to potential to win a lottery ticket to pay off gambling debts to the mob. And it does lead to some interesting setups and scenarios. And it does make you wonder how this is all going to pan out in the end. Like, what happens if he doesn't win? Or what happens if something happens where they lose the ticket or something like that? And it's just like, it keeps you on the edge of your seat. And it is a well-made film. It's a w good script, a great cast overall. Good is, And it's just a very pleasant, pleasant surprise. It's one of those real surprises that you don't really think about all that much. But once you really watch it and enjoy it for what it is, and see what it is, you actually do enjoy it for what it is. It's a very underrated movie. I'd say definitely check it out if you can find it. 29th Street. Really good film. And so on that note, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. Uh, next time we meet, we only have two movies to look at for November 8th. Uh, the holiday comedy All I Want for Christmas, which stars Kevin Nealon, Leslie Nielsen, Harley Jane Kozak, uh, Thora Birch, so we'll look at that one. We'll also look at Strictly Business with Tommy Davidson and Halle Berry. And uh, those will be the two that we'll look at. So thank you guys for watching. And as always, if you want to see more videos like this, check out the playlist on the next page. Check out the previous episode. And I'll see you tomorrow for another episode. So thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. And until then, take care.